What's going on all my healthcare brothers and sisters? Today we're going to be talking about the blood flow through the heart as well as the coronary circulation. Let's start simple. The heart is essentially a pump, right? But it's not just any pump. It's a super organized, dual action, life-sustaining marvel. And to understand it, we need to follow the journey of a tiny blood cell. So let's imagine that you're this tiny little red blood cell. You circulate throughout the body, providing life-sustaining oxygen to the cells, tissues, and organs. How do we start? This is how we start. We're going to start our journey up here in this chamber called the right atrium. This is where deoxygenated blood is emptied from our superior vena cava and our inferior vena cava. Directly ahead of you is the tricuspid valve, and it's called that because it has three distinct flaps or leaflets, hence the name tricuspid. So the tricuspid valve is crafted in such a way that when our right atrium up here contracts, the valve opens up, allowing you and the massive flood of fellow red blood cells to stream through. But as soon as you pass and you get past this atrium, and down here into that ventricle, the atrium relaxes, and this valve snaps shut. It ensures that none of you, none of the red blood cells, drift back up into the atrium. Next, we have the right ventricle. It's more muscular and cone-shaped than the atrium, and this is where the real magic starts to happen. The right ventricle is gonna build up a whole lot of energy, and it's going to squeeze. We call this a contraction. So the deoxygenated blood is sent to its next destination via the lungs. It's gonna get there from our pulmonary valve into our pulmonary arteries. Now, most of the time when we think of our arteries, we think of vessels carrying oxygen-rich blood, but here's where the pulmonary arteries like to flip the script. These are the only arteries in the body that carry blood rich in carbon dioxide and are low in oxygen. All right, time for a quick pit stop in our journey. Let's think critically for a moment. As a red blood cell, you're heading to the lungs next, but why? Why not straight to the brain, the arms, the legs? Why do we have to go to the lungs first? Well, the lungs are like our nature's own filling stations, right? As a red blood cell, when you offload that carbon dioxide, which is a waste product from the body, into the lungs, you're also going to pick up a fresh supply of, you guessed it, oxygen. Every tissue, every organ, every tiny little cell within inside our body is going to require oxygen to produce energy and function effectively. Without this crucial pickup from the lungs, our cells would be left starved, unable to perform their vital tasks. And we're going to talk about this more in a little bit of a future video of why this could be a problem. So fun fact time, do you know that your red blood cell can carry up to four oxygen molecules? That's right. Your unique structure as a red blood cell allows you to bind oxygen super efficiently. Once our red blood cells have picked up that oxygen from our lungs, it's going to return via the pulmonary vein. Again, this is the time that it flips the script. It's going to have oxygen rich blood coming through a vein. Once it gets to that vein, it's going to end up here, up here in our left atrium. This is the counterpart of our right atrium. Our right atrium, we have deoxygenated blood coming back from the body. Our left atrium is where we have oxygenated blood coming back from the lungs. Standing between you and the most powerful chamber of the heart is the bicuspid valve right here between the atrium and our left ventricle. It's also commonly known as the mitral valve, so they are used interchangeably. Such like its counterpart, the tricuspid valve, the bicuspid mitral valve is a one-way flow direction and control. It ensures that it moves blood smoothly from that left atrium into the left ventricle without any hiccups or backward drifts. As a little tiny red blood cell, I want to welcome you to our power chamber, the left ventricle. This is really the superstar of the heart. The walls of this chamber are the thickest. It's muscular, it's robust, and it holds a great responsibility of pumping oxygen-rich blood to every part of our body. From the tips of our toes to the tops of our head, it's the left ventricle that sets that pace. When the left ventricle contracts, remember this, that squeeze, the blood is sent traveling through our aortic valve, right here in between our aorta and our left ventricle. It has to reach a vast networks of arteries, arterioles, and capillaries to deliver that oxygen-rich blood. Once all of that blood 
blood is delivered and those waste products like carbon dioxide are exchanged, the blood is going to return back through the heart from our veins into, of course, you guessed it, our right atrium. One of the most common questions that I'm asked is how am I supposed to remember the orders of the vowels? So I came up with this mnemonic to help you try to remember that. And that is T-P-M-A, try pulling my arm. The T stands for the tricuspid valve. The P stands for the pulmonic valve. The M stands for the mitral or bicuspid valve. And the A stands for the aortic valve, T-P-M-A. Now, every time you see acute vein, you're going to be able to remember this mnemonic. While most systemic and pulmonary circulations do play a vital role, let's ponder this for a second. How does the heart receive oxygen and nutrients when the blood is constantly rushing out? Our answer begins with the coronary arteries that we have that supply oxygen to our heart. They originate from the aorta and the arteries wrap around the heart, giving the name coronary. So their primary mission is to furnish the heart's muscle, the myocardium, with oxygen so that it maintains its function. Remember, if the heart does not get oxygen, it will die and cease to function. First up, we have the left coronary artery that comes right off the aorta here. It's also known as the LCA. It emerges directly from the aorta and it quickly divides into two significant branches. We have the left anterior descending artery, also known as the LAD. This ventures down the heart's interior surface as it heads towards the apex of our heart. Remember, that's the bottom of our heart down here. Its primary role is to oxygenate the heart's front walls and a hefty part of the interventricular septum that separates the ventricles. If this artery were to become obstructed, dire consequences might follow. It's commonly known as the Widowmaker because it provides so much oxygen to so much of the heart's myocardium that if it were to be obstructed and it was unable to do that, a lot of the myocardium would die. So we're always making sure we're looking out for this one. Next up, we have the circumflex artery and that wraps around the heart. So this artery gracefully arcs around the left side of the heart and it provides blood to the lateral left atrium as well as the ventricle. On the opposite side is the right coronary artery and you can see that it just comes a little bit down that right uh, atrium right there. So branching off of the RCA is the posterior interventricular artery or it's also commonly known as the posterior descending artery PDA. It travels down the heart's back, providing blood to its rear wall, as well as the base of the septum. And then lastly, we have the right marginal artery that is known as our RMA, which is the largest branch that is dedicated solely to that right ventricle. So let's think about our body's circulatory system as a vast highway network of blood vessels that act as roads. But just as highways can face obstruction, so can these vessels. So blockages that can happen within these vessels can disrupt the smooth flow of blood, leading to the potential death of the heart muscle. But how can we get a picture of what's happening inside these intricate pathways of our arteries? Welcome to one of my favorite procedures called percutaneous coronary angiography. This procedure often starts in the femoral artery of the groin, though in some cases they are able to do it through the radial artery and our wrists, just depending on what's going on with the patient. A small sheath is first inserted into the groin or into our radial artery, acting as a gateway for the catheter. The catheter winds its way up, passing through the aorta, and it eventually reaches the ostium, which is the natural opening of our coronary arteries. Using live x-ray vigils, this is so cool, they provide a roadmap for surgeons to ensure that the catheter is in its precise placement. A contrast dye is then introduced into the arteries, coursing through them, revealing the pathways, as well as any potential blockages on the x-ray monitor. This luminous material paints a clear picture for the interventional cardiologist, identifying narrowed and blocked segments that could pose risk, as you see here in this picture. So if you see here, you can see that there's a blockage taking place. We're unable to visualize a lot of the arteries when we're injecting that contrast dye. But if the interventional cardiologist is able to intervene, look what happens here, right? We're able to remove that blockage or put something in to help with the blockage. And look at all these beautiful arteries 
that we're able to see now on our imaging because of that intervention. So there are risks present, right? If the interventional cardiologist is able to perform an intervention, they will do so. But it's really gonna be dependent on the patient's medical history, risk factors, benefits, and degrees of the blockage. Once this investigation is complete, the catheter is then carefully removed from the body, and then there is a dressing or something that is going to be placed over that site for a period of time to help with the clotting of those arteries. Luckily for the blockages, there is a safeguard ensuring that the heart is never out of its rhythm. These are known as anastomosis. So these tiny arterial pathways weave together forming direct connections between smaller branches of the larger arteries. They circumvent blockages ensuring that the oxygen rich blood still reaches its destination for a temporary period of time. So we will still have to intervene. It's only temporary. These minuscule connections often overlooked in the grand scheme of everything that has to do with cardiac anatomy are nature's backup plan also known as collateral circulation. While arteries do provide a fresh supply of oxygen blood to the cardiac muscle, it's the coronary veins that are the couriers that collect that used deoxygenated blood and return it back to the heart. So among these veins, there's three that stick out for their prominent roles. So first, we have the great cardiac vein. That's that vein all the way over here. It ascends along the anterior interventricular sulcus and travels down the posterior side of the heart, draining the left atrium as well as both ventricles. It's a big one. Next, we have our middle cardiac vein. And this vein is situated at the heart's posterior. It is the guardian of the heart's back and it drains that posterior left ventricle. And then lastly, but certainly not least, we have our small cardiac vein. And this is the one that skirts around the right atrioventricular sulcus edge, ensuring that the right atrium as well as parts of the right ventricle are also drained. So the accumulation of this journey takes place within that coronary sinus. So that sinus is kind of right up here. This vein channels all of that blood back to its starting point in the right atrium. If you're finding this video helpful and you want additional resources to help beef up your game when it comes to anatomy and physiology, I highly recommend that you go over to nursechunkstore.com where there's a ton of additional resources that are available to you to help you ace those AP exams. And that, besties, is the round trip of blood flow through the heart and the coronary arteries. Before we wrap up, think about this. What might happen if one of the valves doesn't work properly? How would that affect the blood's journey? Answer the question in the comments below. As always, I hope you're having a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.